Good to see you guys. Is it all right if we begin with a word of prayer? All right, let's pray. Father, we want to invite your spirit to be with us today. We want to pray that you would help us as we take a look into science and your word, that you would um, speak to us. Lord, I pray for the Latu family that is grieving the loss of Siwa. We ask that in a special way you would comfort and minister to them. And Lord, I pray for the students as they're going through midterms, that you would give them strength and grace in this difficult time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was trying to take attendance for a physics class. And um, I got to the place where Josh Schulderbrand's name came up. And I said to my students, because Josh wasn't present, I said to my students, does anybody know where Josh is? And my students said to me, oh, he's invisible. <laughs> he's here, but he's invisible. And then some other voices chimed in, oh, yeah, 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 he's here. He's just invisible. And I did something I probably should not have done, but uh, I thought, well, I did it anyway. So I, I decided that uh, I would try to reason with them. So I said to them, <laughs> yeah, my downfall. I said to them, I said, um, what are you going to say when Josh walks through the door? And they're like, oh, no problem. He's going to materialize outside the room. And then apparently Josh has the ability not only to be invisible, but to walk through walls. Okay, and he's going to materialize outside of the room, and then he's going to walk in. So I had a dilemma, and my dilemma was simply this. I'm looking at this prestigious room full of future doctors and dentists <laughs> who are assuring me that, that Josh is present and that he's invisible, <laughs> and um, in that I had a dilemma. Do I, do I mark Josh present, or do I mark him tardy? And I guess I just did not have enough faith because uh, I, I marked him tardy. I marked him tardy. <clears throat> you know, sometimes, does it ever feel like when people talk about God that he's kind of like my invisible student? You can see him. You can touch him. You can't see him, I'm sorry. You can't see him. You can't touch him. And your friends around you or the people around you tell, you tell you that you're supposed to mark him present in your life. But after the stuff that's happened, after the nightmare that you've been through, after the stuff that's hurt so bad that you can't understand how a good God could allow something like this to happen in your life, what do you do? Sometimes it feels like it's easier to just kind of throw away faith and deal with, you know, the rest of life and just say, well, let me deal with, like, my career and, like, relationships and stuff that I can actually reach out and touch and feel and actually be able to analyze. Don't let me have to deal with stuff that requires faith. You know, give me analytical stuff like science. Like science. Okay. That seems reasonable. When I was in college, uh, and they did have colleges back then, when I was in college <laughs> back then, um, I was taught the Big Bang Theory, that there was a time in the universe when the universe got a little upset and it blew up, right? And that produced this explosion of stuff, right, that just scattered all over the universe. And after the Big Bang, after all the stuff blew up, of course, as it's blowing up and it's flying out there into space, it was slowing down because gravity was going to cause it to slow down and kind of pull it back together. And that was the theory that I was told by my professors, and we believed for years and years until in the 1990s this thing came around. You know what this is? The Hubble, yeah. And somebody actually took the time to actually measure the expansion of the universe. And they said, hey, Houston, we got a problem. Because it's not slowing down. Now that's weird, when you have a giant thing that blows up, most of the time the things slow down after they've, they've exploded, right? 
But they said what we did was we actually measured the stuff. It's not slowing down. In fact, it's not even the same speed. It's speeding up. Now, how can you have something that explodes, and it explodes, and it actually speeds up as it goes out further and further? But that's what they measured, and that's what they found. And so in came this new theory. This is from NASA. So the explosion of the universe has not been slowing due to gravity, as everyone thought it was supposed to be, but it's accelerating. No one can expect this. No one expected this. No one knew how to explain it. But something was causing it. Theorists still don't know what the correct explanation is, but they gave this solution a name. It's called dark energy. Dark energy. Oh, interesting. More is unknown than is known. We know how much dark energy there is because we know how it affects the universe's expansion. Other than that, it is a complete mystery. But it's an important mystery. It turns out that roughly 68% of the universe is dark energy. Dark matter makes up 27% of the universe. The rest, everything on Earth, everything you can observe with your eyes, all normal matter adds up to less than 5% of the universe. I want you to think about this for a second. Everything, everything on this Earth, everything in our solar system, everything, every planet, every star, and you know we estimate right now that there are equal numbers of stars in the universe as there are grains of sand on the Earth seashore. If you were to go count on every seashore, all the grains of sand, that's how many stars we think there are in the universe. But if you take all of that, all the stellar dust, all the planets, all the suns, all the stars, all of that stuff, and you add it all up, we estimate right now that that is 5% of the universe. The other 95% of the universe is dark matter and dark energy. Only 5% of the universe is visible. The other 95% of the universe, we have to take based on faith that it exists. The science of faith. When searching, again, NASA, when searching for dark matter, astronomers must go on a sort of ghost hunt. That's because dark matter is an invisible substance that cannot be direct, seen directly. Yet it makes up the bulk of the universe's mass and forms the scaffolding upon which the galaxies are built. Dark matter is gravitational glue that holds galaxies as well as galaxy clusters together. All galaxies, according to this theory, form and are embedded within clouds of dark matter. However, the type of particles that make up dark matter is still a mystery. At present, there is no direct evidence in the lab that dark matter even exists. Byron said, particle physicists would not even talk about dark matter if the cosmologists didn't say it has to be there based on observations of its effects. In other words, we are surrounded right now, we are surrounded right now by dark matter and dark energy. This means that for every one of you, there, it would be like me saying that uh, for every one of you, there are 20 other beings in this room right now that you can't see and you can't touch. 20 others. That's what we say when 95% of the universe is invisible or untouchable. 95%. We are surrounded by this stuff and we don't even know what it is or what it is made out of. Isn't that incredible? If you're gonna believe in science, you have to believe that 95% of the universe is out there and we can't see it, we can't even, we can't even touch it, 95% of it. Even in science, we are asked to believe or to have faith that 95% of the universe is out there, but we just can't see it. So, it requires faith both in science and it requires faith with God. Sometimes it is really hard to believe in God. When you have cried and cried and cried out to God that he would help save somebody that you loved and they died, 
It's hard to believe that God is out there. And when you've prayed and prayed and prayed that the abuse would stop, and the abuse didn't stop, it's hard to believe that God is good. Or when you've pled with God, begged God to stop the pain, to stop the anxiety, to stop the hurt, and God doesn't answer, it's hard to believe that there's a good God. And I'm suggesting that just like it takes faith to believe in the universe exists today, it takes faith to believe that God is good. Now, am I saying, am I expecting you to just suck up the pain and believe that somehow God is good after the nightmare you've been through? After you prayed and there were no answers? After you cried and you asked God to please stop it and it didn't stop? Am I saying that you, you just need to suck up the pain and just sort of somehow, somehow say, oh yeah, yeah, God is good. No, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm suggesting that he understands how hard it's to believe when you're badly hurt. He knows what it's like to struggle to believe God cares. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm suggesting that he can relate to your feelings that God has abandoned you. And that God understands your struggle to trust him. He understands. He's not expecting you just to say, oh yeah, 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 God is good. He knows what it's like to go through that junk. He knows what it's like to hurt and to cry out to God and wish that the stuff would stop and it doesn't stop. He understands the struggle. But I'm saying to you that he will also work with you where you're at. Even if you don't, if you struggle to believe that he's real or if you struggle to believe that he's good, he will work with you where you're at. It's okay if you struggle to believe he's good. I'm suggesting that God gets upset about injustice, that he's upset about the stuff that was pulled on you. Ezekiel puts it this way. He says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my hot jealousy have I spoken against the rest of the nations and against all of Edom, who have given to themselves my land with wholehearted joy and with uttermost contempt, that they might empty it out and possess it for a prey and a spoil. God was hot, hot with jealousy when he saw what was done to his people in the Old Testament. And may I suggest that God is hot with jealousy when he saw what happened to you? May I suggest that fret not yourself because of the evildoers, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, you will not be able to find them. You know, when, when that guy got waylaid, remember the, remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Remember the guy that got hit on the road, beat up on the road of life, right? Remember that? Did you know that God sent the priest to help him? And he didn't. He sent the Levite to help him, and he didn't. And it wasn't until the Good Samaritan came along that somebody cared enough about that guy to get involved. And can I suggest that maybe God sent people to stop the craziness when you prayed that he sent people to get involved, and they just didn't. 
They passed by on the other side. They pretended like it wasn't a big issue. Oh, somebody else will deal with it. But God hated it. His hot jealousy burned within him as he watched people hurt you, and he tried to get involved and tried to stop it, but they would not. May I suggest he will give you grace to endure your affliction in order that your faith fail not. That he promises to relieve the burden on your mind, to comfort you when you're sorrowing, and to give you hope when you're despondent. I would like to suggest that the situation that you went through was Satan's effort to get you to hate God. That Satan particularly designed that event. He designed the situation that happened. He put it all together with a purpose and a reason. He wanted to get you to hate God and to pull away from God. In fact, Inspiration tells us that our greatest trials come from those who, what? Profess godliness. That it might have even come from somebody that was godly. But I like this statement. David is repeating me again and again. David in the Bible. David is repeating again and again in different ways, trust God. Trust him to act. Don't get upset because God is your God. And he is working for you, even right now. You don't have to charge in and try to sort things out by yourself because God is here and at work. We can praise him. We can even smile because no one can outwit God. Isn't that what happened with Joseph? The very thing that his brothers, you with me? The very thing that his brothers determined to do to destroy Joseph, to make sure that his dreams would never come true, were the very things that God used to make sure that that dream came true. I know it's hard to trust God sometimes, especially in the middle of it, when it makes no sense and it just hurts and you've prayed and it seems like there's no answers, no God. He seems like my invisible student. And there's that temptation in your heart to just pull out the, your, your phone and just mark God as absent. But may I suggest that if you hang on and you have a choice, you don't have to, but if, if you want to hang on and you want to say, God, you know, I, I, I need help. I need help to trust you. I need help to believe that somehow you're going to bring good out of this, that God will help you, that he will make himself responsible for you having faith, that it isn't your responsibility to make yourself have faith, that God says, I will be the author and the finisher of your faith. I will make myself responsible for you to maintain faith. So I want to encourage you. It's OK to struggle and say, I, I don't know if I even trust you anymore. That's OK. But go ahead and say to him, but listen, I'm, 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 I'm open. I'm willing. I, I want you to help me to heal. I want you to help me to believe if there are reasons that I can believe in your existence and your goodness. And he will work with you and help you to believe it. Is that OK? You OK with that? OK, let's pray. Lord, you know what some of the folks in this room have gone through. You know how they are struggling in their hearts to believe that 
you are good. But Lord, you promised that you would help them. You promised that you would give them the faith they need to get through this, the grace they need so that their faith fail not. So Lord, I pray that you would give them evidences that you're there, that you're working, that somehow in the background you are changing things around and working things out for them like you did for Joseph. That the very thing that Satan thought to use to destroy them, to destroy their relationship with you, is the very thing that you're going to use, Lord, to actually help them to be able to realize the dreams that you've given for them. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.